<laughs> well, in my opening statement, the great COVID panic. Now, in a moment, I will be joined by one of the co-authors of a new book uh, that's making headlines across the world. It's the number one release on Amazon.com at the moment. The book is titled The Great COVID Panic, asking the question as to whether the world got this response uh, to this crisis right or did we take a wrong turn that eventually wiped trillions of dollars around the world while making some handful of nations richer than ever before. Now, in the great panic of early 2020, nearly every government in the world restricted the movements of its population, disrupted the education of its children, suspended normal individual liberties, hijacked its healthcare system, and in other ways increased its direct control of people's lives. Now, attempts to control the new coronavirus in most countries made the number of deaths from both the virus and other health problems higher. Some countries and regions snapped out of this madness in early 2021 or even before. Yet other governments still in late 2021, like here in Sri Lanka, are even more frantically obsessed with control. For a simple example, look at the lockdowns. And science is proving that lockdown don't address the fundamental aspects of taking control of the virus. We as a developing country here in Sri Lanka keeps resorting to that particular action due to public pressure, instead of mitigating the public fear. Why did 2020 become so suddenly and so forcefully a year of global panic over a virus that for most people is barely more dangerous than a standard issue flu virus? Questions are now being raised around the world asking what led to a, sim a similar response that the world resort to during the Spanish flu almost a century later. Surely, the science was far greater, far advanced, and medicine and, and safe practices were at the best it has ever been in the history of this world. Despite the fact that the current Sri Lankan government putting a smiley face out in the front to keep concerning Sri Lankans calm and then fighting a massive battle in the back needs to be recognized at this moment. Because perception that the economy is stronger than before the coronavirus pandemic are wrong and main contributor to that devastation is the lockdowns which doesn't work the way you think. I'm going to talk uh, more in depth uh, on that in a moment with Professor with the School of Economics at the University of New South Wales, Australia, Professor Gigi Foster, once we cross over to Sydney, Australia in a moment. But first, here is Zanidu with Anwasan with tonight's uh, take on the real story. Uh, hello, Zanidu. What are you focusing uh, on today? Hello, Mahesh. Nice to join you again. Good evening. Tonight, my focus is something that's rarely discussed, even around the world. Did we really deal with the pandemic the way we are supposed to do in a global health emergency? We've seen many versions of the coronavirus going around the world before COVID-19. And then there was the Ebola crisis. But not one single time did we act the way we did right now. Now people are asking the question why? And they want to know, did the authorities act from a point of fear or science? The reason why this speculation arises is that many, particularly within Sri Lanka's opposition, have been quick to call for lockdowns in the general uptake of cases a process common amongst virus conditions as what is faced right now with COVID-19. Low-income countries with weaker health infrastructures, lower state capacity and great issues of data to inform policy face an even tougher challenge between health and economic costs. The need to balance these challenges during the crisis has been much discussed. But an equally important aspect to think through is the potentially long-lasting impacts of policies used now to tackle the pandemic. While the immediate costs of the crisis are large and visible, long-run consequences are less visible but potentially large. This is clearer when reviewing the studies by the International Growth Center, where a group of leading economists studied the effects of lockdowns in Western African countries during the Ebola crisis. Factors that genuinely miss the public eye, such as the survival of SMEs and the much broader impact on human capital, such as the limitation of over 1.3 billion students across 153 countries from going to schools, was considered within this study. Pre-epidemic Sierra Leone was enjoying rapid growth, especially given a surge in growth from 2011, and international predictions 
possible for this to be sustained over the coming years. Then Ebola struck. Over the course of the epidemic, GDP per capita fell by 22%, going back to its level in 2012. Starting from 2016, there was a gradual recovery in economic output, but even by 2018, GDP per capita had risen by only 13% and was still far below its pre-crisis level. The economic impacts of Ebola during the epidemic in Sierra Leone was enormous. In a year, the annual growth rate of GDP plummeted from 8.9% to minus 2%. Market closures impacted those whose livelihood depended on them. The self-employment sector, which accounted for 91% of the labor force, shed around 170,000 jobs, with revenues for surviving enterprises falling by 40%, and a further 9,000 jobs were lost in wage employment. As part of social distancing measures to prevent contagion during the Ebola pandemic, schools were closed in 2014, May, and reopened in April 2015, as the epidemic began to slow. Most students lost around 39 weeks of schooling as a result. Further studies have shown that certain students had left school. Uh, lack Lockdowns don't work because lockdowns are basically inhibiting well people. And well people don't transmit the virus. It's only sick individuals that transmit the virus. So Sri Lanka only needs to lock down people who are sick with fever and uh, upper respiratory symptoms. Those are the people who need to quarantine and they need early treatment to prevent hospitalization and death. So open up Sri Lanka and just take care of the sick people. I think we're going to have the virus with us for several years in the future. So we just need to treat the virus early. It'll be like influenza. We don't completely get rid of influenza, but we treat it and we get through it year by year. We don't lock down the country for influenza. In reference to the vaccine, a large economic aspect has been almost deliberately left in the dark. In exploring the financial incentives behind the vaccination, certain companies have made revenues notified to the public. The vaccine brought in $3.5 billion in revenue in the first three months of this year, nearly a quarter of its total revenue for Pfizer. The vaccine was far and away Pfizer's biggest source of revenue. During the first three months of 2021, Pfizer paid $2.2 billion US dollars of cash dividends, or $0.39 per share of common stock. Quartz.com studied that Moderna's focus cost for sales of the first two doses of the vaccine was $18.4 billion for 2021, so the booster shot could add about $9 billion to that. Pfizer projected at least $15 billion in sales for 1 billion COVID-19 vaccine doses, so the booster shot would bring an additional $7.5 billion US dollars to the pharma giant. AstraZeneca reported $275 million US dollars in revenue from its COVID-19 vaccine in the first three months of the year. Excluding the COVID-19 vaccine, AstraZeneca reported revenue of $7.3 billion US dollars. That's 15% higher than the same time last year, 11% at constant exchange rates. Core earnings increased 55% to $1.63 US dollars per share, and the company expects that in 2021 they will reach $4.75 US dollars to $5 a share. Executives attributed the growth to higher than expected sales of new medicines, especially cancer and cardiovascular drugs, an important point of concern when considering whether anyone is profiteering of the vaccination process. Everyone must support the government's effort to vaccinate the entire population as soon as possible if this is the way forward. We also, however, need to keep searching for the truth because as we all know, this will certainly not be the last new virus the world will ever see. Perhaps Mahesh, your guest, Professor Gigi Foster, might have a fresh perspective. Indeed, uh, I intend uh, on asking those questions and uh, get a take on that matter. Thank you very much, Nanadu Thanam, some of the real story there. Right after the break, Professor Gigi Foster from the University of New South Wales in Australia will be joining me from Sydney. Back in a moment, this is Get Real.